Hi everyone, my name is Valent Atsahi. I'm one of the cardiology fellows at the Cleveland Clinic, and today I'm going to be giving a basic approach to acute decompensated heart failure. So what I want to focus on is understanding what is meant by decompensated heart failure, understanding why patients decompensate and require hospitalization, provide a framework for diagnosing and classifying heart failure patients, knowing a little bit about the treatment of heart failure, and very importantly, asking knowing when to call for help either from a cardiologist or an intensive care consultant. A few definitions which I think make a crucial distinction. So heart failure is a clinical syndrome that's characterized by impaired myocardial performance, which leads to two general groups of problems, problems of circulatory insufficiency and problems of volume overload. In contrast, the cardiomyopathy, broadly speaking, is a myocardial disorder in which the heart muscle is structurally and functionally abnormal. So not everyone with a cardiomyopathy has heart failure, but it's what predisposes patients to developing decompensated heart failure. So what are the causes of a cardiomyopathy? Well, this could be a talk in and of itself. Very briefly, ischemic cardiomyopathy is the leading cause of it, so prior heart attacks or heart damage, hypertension, valvular heart disease, arrhythmia, toxins, and a whole other host of things can cause someone to have a cardiomyopathy. What causes someone to decompensate? Well, here's a review of a large registry of patients with heart failure admissions. They found that respiratory infections, acute coronary syndromes, arrhythmias, uncontrolled hypertension, non-adherence to medications or diet, and acute kidney injury were the leading causes of decompensated heart failure admissions. So what are the symptoms? What do these patients actually tell you is going on? Again, I like to think of two general categories of problems, increased circulatory volume or decreased cardiac output. So they might be short of breath on exertion or when lying flat or wake up in the middle of the night short of breath. They might have swelling in their legs or ascites. They might have swelling in their abdomen and they could have weight gain. These are all signs of increased circulatory volume. On the contrast, some patients might tell you that they're fatigued, anorexic, losing weight or depressed, even having lightheadedness or syncope. These could point towards decreased cardiac output. And patients could have symptoms from either of these buckets or both. Now, when you examine these patients, what do you see? I like to examine the patients from head to toe and characterize my findings as either suggesting decreased cardiac output or suggesting increased circulatory volume. So from head to toe, if a patient is confused or altered, that might indicate low output. If they have elevated jugular venous pressure, crackles in the lungs, or dullness to percussion in the lungs, those could indicate increased volume. A third heart sound can incre uh, indicate increased volume. If they have abdominal distension, ascites, or leg swelling, these could all suggest increased volume. By comparison, having cool extremities or decreased urine output can show that someone has low cardiac output. Looking at their vitals is of course important. Hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea can suggest shock from decreased cardiac output. And hypoxia and tachypnea are commonly found in patients with increased fluid overload. Now this is a slide we're gonna to return to a couple of times. This is an important way of categorizing patients based on the presence of congestion and the presence of low perfusion. So if you look at the category of patients in category A, these patients are warm and dry, so they might have a cardiomyopathy, but they're sitting at home adequately perfusing without fluid overload. Now, if they go on a cruise and have a lot of dietary indiscretions, they might accumulate fluid and fall into group B, warm and wet, where they have increased fluid overload, but they're still perfusing their organs. Now, if unfortunately, let's say they have a myocardial infarction, well, they might become cold or have low perfusion from low cardiac output. And there's even a group of patients who have low cardiac output despite having uh, no congestion and no volume overload. And this is a particularly tough group of patients to manage. Now, what about the labs you're checking? This is a busy slide because I wanna get the point across that there's no one lab that's gonna diagnose your patient with heart failure. And what you're often doing is taking the sum of your basic lab work and kind of adding it together to put together a consistent picture. So the first labs I wanna look at are the labs that you might call somewhat specific to the circulatory system. So the first one I have here is the anti BMP, which I've colored blue because if anything, it can be used as a marker of increased circulatory volume. So anti BMP is released in the setting of myocardial dilation or wall stress and can be elevated in a lot of patients with heart failure. A caveat about this is that increasing age and renal failure tend to increase your ProBMP and obesity can decrease it. Now in red is lactic acid, which can be a sign of end organ malperfusion due to low cardiac output. And finally, a word on the troponin, which a lot of these patients will have their troponin checked. And it's a tricky thing to evaluate in this setting. The troponin might be elevated because of myocardial injury, or it can also just be elevated in the setting of chronic heart failure and renal failure. So you have to be very careful and interpret it in the context of everything else that's going on.
Now, your basic CBC and basic metabolic panel are very important. You may find your patients anemic, which can exacerbate or augment their heart failure symptoms. An elevated white cell count might be from the pneumonia that's put them into heart failure, or it could be related to a different process altogether. Acute kidney injury is very common, very challenging, and very important. It can be caused either by renovascular congestion, which is from increased volume overload, or from low cardiac output causing acute tubular necrosis. Looking at your liver function and coagulopathy studies is also very important. You may have a transaminitis from low output heart failure, and your bilirubin and your coax might be elevated from congestive hepatopathy from volume overload or ischemic liver injury from low cardiac output. Now, the EKG is very important. There's no one finding that will diagnose heart failure for you, but it can often point to useful clues for etiology and cause of exacerbation. Look at this EKG, for example. This patient has atrial fibrillation, and if this is new, this may be what tips them over into heart failure. What about this one? This patient, unfortunately, is having a large anterior myocardial infarction, and this might be the cause of their low cardiac output and concomitant heart failure. And how about this one? While this EKG shows low voltages and also loss of R waves in the anterior leads, this can be seen in advanced cardiac amyloid. Now, this patient doesn't have to be in heart failure, but if you see this EKG in a patient with heart failure, it's a very important clue as to what's going on. The chest X-ray can be very helpful. You may find alveolar edema, curly B lines, which are small horizontal lines on the lung periphery, cardiomegaly or increased cardiac silhouette, dilated upper pulmonary vessels, pleural effusions or fluid in the fissures. For example, this X-ray shows you a pronounced cardiac silhouette, dilated or cephalized pulmonary vessels, and fluid in the This patient also has cardiomegaly and has profound alveolar edema. And this patient has curly B lines. You may be able to appreciate these subtle horizontal lines in the lung periphery. Now, the workup of heart failure can include lots and lots of complicated diagnostic studies. And just one I want to highlight is the echocardiogram. This can tell you a lot about systolic, diastolic function, valvular function, pericardial disease, and can even make suggestions of volume status or hemodynamic parameters, and should be part of the evaluation of heart failure. Now, what about the differential diagnosis? After all, these patients are presenting with respiratory complaints. Could they have COPD or pneumonia? Some of them might have circulatory shock and low output. Well, what about a pulmonary embolism or pericardial effusion with tamponade? Maybe their only symptom is volume overload. That can also be found in patients with cirrhosis or renal failure. This Venn diagram shows how difficult this can be because your patient with heart failure might have one or multiple of these symptoms. So if they're presenting with hypotension and shock, you will need to rule out a pulmonary embolism and consider pericardial tamponade. If their only symptoms are fatigue or exertional intolerance, what if this is symptomatic anemia? So there can be a lot of confounding variables, but ultimately, using the things we talked about, history, physical, and labs, you should be able to arrive at a diagnosis. So I'm going to return to this slide because it will then become very important to classify your patient, both for their management as well as for their triage. So a patient who's warm and wet would be appropriate for admission to a floor, such as a medicine ward, where they can be managed appropriately and safely. The patients, by contrast, who are cold because of low cardiac output might require higher levels of care, such as an intensive care unit, and often do require management by cardiology, either as a primary team or in consultation. Now, what about management? So this is a very simple schematic. On the left, you have blood returning to the heart from the veins in the body. Then the heart, of course, pumps into the lungs, where they become oxygenated and return to the heart, which then pumps it to the rest of the organs in the body. Here, I've just put the kidney and the brain as two of the important end organs that we need to perfuse and that we're monitoring. Preload can roughly be thought of as the blood that's filling the ventricle. Afterload is the resistance that the heart pumps against. And chronotropy and inotropy refer to how fast and how hard the heart beats. These are the parameters that we are adjusting when managing our patients with heart failure. For example, you can give your patient Lasix or nitrates or put them on positive pressure to decrease their preload. Vasodilators like hydralazine and ACE inhibitors can decrease afterload. Chronotropy and inotropy can be affected by beta blockers, which many of these patients are commonly prescribed, and they may require you to even raise their chronotropy or inotropy with an inotrope such as dobutamine or milrinone. Also important is supportive care. That might be supporting their lungs with nasal cannula, CPAP, or intubation. 
supporting the kidneys with renal replacement or supporting the heart itself, whether it's with mechanical support or a pulmonary artery catheter. So let's talk about how to manage each of these different subtypes. Take, for example, this patient. They're 64, they have hypertension, diabetes, and a prior infarct, and they're here with dyspnea and weight gain. They're hypertensive on a bit of O2 by nasal cannula. Their JVP is very elevated. They have crackles in the lungs and warm extremities. They have an acute kidney injury and an elevated antipropion P, but their LFTs and their lactate are pretty normal. So most of these findings are showing increased circulatory volume, like their elevated JVP and crackles in the lungs. There doesn't appear to be any evidence of end organ malperfusion. So if we had to classify this patient, they would probably be warm and wet. They're admitted to internal medicine, where they're given intravenous Lasix for preload. Their oral vasodilators are uptitrated to reduce afterload. Because of acute kidney injury, the team initially avoided an ACE inhibitor. And their home beta blocker was continued. After all, they had no signs of impaired cardiac output. How about this patient? They're 44. They have a familial dilated cardiomyopathy. And their ejection fraction is 10%. They're coming with respiratory distress. They're desatting on a non-rebreather. They're tachycardic. Their JVP is very elevated. They have four plus edema and cold extremities. Their creatinine is five. Their liver function tests are in the thousands. Their lactate is elevated and their pro-BMP is elevated. Looking at this patient's findings, they have evidence of volume overload in blue, JVP elevated, edema, elevated pro-BMP, as well as decreased perfusion with cold extremities and a lactate elevation. So I would say this patient's cold and wet. Let's see what happened to them. So they were admitted to a cardiac ICU. They were given intravenous Lasix to try and get them net negative and decrease their preload. Nephrology was consulted because of their acute kidney injury. There was a concern that he would need dialysis. His afterload was managed with intravenous vasodilator, in this case, sodium nitroprusside. He was intubated and placed on mechanical ventilation for hypoxia and increased work of breathing. Note that the positive pressure from mechanical ventilation decreases preload as well as decreases afterload. Their home beta blocker was held because their cardiac output was felt to be low, and a consideration was made for a PA catheter, an inotrope, and mechanical circulatory support. Now, what about this patient? They're 85 years old. They have cardiac amyloidosis, CKD, persistent atrial fibrillation, and a prior CVA, and they're coming with fatigue and confusion. On exam, they're hypotensive, tachycardic, satting 92% on room air. They're confused. Their JVP is actually not elevated, it's eight centimeters, and their lungs are clear, but their extremities are very cold. Their creatinine is elevated to four. Their AST and ALT are in the thousands. Their lactate is elevated at 4.2, and their pro-BNP is actually below their baseline. What are we to do with this patient? Well, let's look at the pertinent findings. I would say what's most striking to me is that they have evidence of poor cardiac output. They're confused with cold extremities and a lactate elevation but there aren't really any signs of volume overload. So this is a patient who was cold and dry and they were appropriately triaged. They went to a cardiac ICU and let's see what they did. So they didn't give anything for preload because the patient was already dry. They attempted a vasodilator, but the patient couldn't tolerate it because of hypotension. They considered an inotrope, but held off because of his rapid atrial fibrillation. They then considered mechanical support but ultimately because of his age and comorbidities made consultation to palliative care. I think this last patient gives an example of how tough it can be to manage these patients, which is why the last thing I wanna talk about is knowing when to call for help. I would consider three scenarios where it's very appropriate and sometimes even necessary to call a cardiology consultation. If we have a patient in cardiogenic shock, so they're altered, hypotensive, in renal or respiratory failure with lactic acidosis or LFTs, if they're decompensated with a high-risk etiology, especially in acute coronary syndrome, but also situations like endocarditis or amyloidosis, and also the first-time evaluation of decompensated heart failure, where very specific diagnostic tests might be necessary. And that's all I had. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and good luck.